83 funding bill for congressional operations. The rules panel met Monday to decide the format for debate on the funding bill. That format will be used when the bill is brought to the House floor later this week. The bill allocates money for congressional spending for the next fiscal year, which includes expenses for representatives, their staffs, and committees. It also includes funds for the operation of such agencies as the Library of Congress and the General Accounting Office. Which one did you want to offer? There's been a request of filming in Portland. Brian Jackson. Mr. Chairman, yes. No objection, but I would like to enter into a short colloquy with you when the hearing begins. Fine. No objection. There's also been a request for the filming and taking of still pictures today's proceedings. Any objection? There's also been a request from an artist for a painting to be <laughs> Under legislative appropriations. The matter before the committee is H.R. 5427 of the Committee on Appropriations. Making appropriations for the legislative branch for the fiscal year ending in September 30, 1993, and for other purposes. Did you want to say something? Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, if I, if I might, uh, when you uh, and our good friend Tony Bielenson uh, made the announcement in, uh, at two different times on the floor that uh, we were going to have a pre-requirement, uh, pre-filing requirement right. on amendments, uh, I had uh, raised a uh, serious question at the time that, uh, that this really is the first time that uh, the Rules Committee has recommended limiting the amendment process on a legislative branch appropriation bill. Uh, certainly in the last uh, 14 years that I've been here, and I would ask unanimous consent to submit for the record uh, uh, a record from the 95th Congress up to the present date, along with a letter, Mr. Chairman, that I had written to the speaker, and I uh, respectfully sent a copy to you, uh, questioning this procedure. And uh, uh, it is very difficult because, you know, we don't have a legislative committee as such. We have a House Administration Committee, but uh, members themselves don't really have an opportunity to work their will uh, on, on the issue of, uh, of congressional spending, as we do uh, on the other branches. And uh, it just concerns me, and uh, uh, we have 12 other appropriation bills uh, coming before us uh, at a future date, and I just hope that we don't get into this business of legislating and appropriation bills and uh, uh, but limiting the, the cutting process or the adding on process. So I just bring this to your attention, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, we'll discuss this, I'm sure, on the floor. But uh, uh, hopefully we will come out with an open uh, amendment process here today and let members work their will on the floor uh, without giving any, any special privilege to any particular member, uh, but allowing them what is due process and what is uh, allowed under the rules of the House. And we just wanted to get that in for the record. Okay. And might I have unanimous consent to submit a copy of that? Without letter? objection. 
The first witness before the committee will be the Honorable Vic Fazio of California. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Do you want to be joined with the ranking minority member? Mr. Chairman, I have a statement which I can uh, read indirectly. It's rather brief. Um, I don't know at the moment uh, that it would take more than just a few seconds, if you don't mind. Sure. Mr. Chairman, uh, I appear along with my cohort, Mr. Lewis, before the Rules Committee today to. Uh, seek uh, a rule governing the consideration of H.R. 5427, the fiscal year 93 Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill. The bill covers, as all of you know, appropriations for the operation of the House, the Joint Committees, our support agencies, CBO, OTA, CRS, and GAO, the Architect of the Capitol, the Library of Congress, the GPO, and the Copyright Royalty Tribunal. Funds for the Senate will be added by the other body when the bill is taken up on that side of the Capitol. The Committee on Appropriations reported the bill on the 18th of June. Let me summarize it quickly. 1.8 billion, a little bit more, in budget authority, a reduction of almost 300 million under budget, a reduction of almost 20 million under the 1992 level in BA, and a reduction of 20 million under our discretionary 602B allocation. Uh, which was, of course, accorded us by the full committee. The bill is very tight. Nine million under current level for House operations. Joint committees and support agencies have been frozen at this year's level. The GAO was reduced even further by $5.5 million. There have been a few small increases in non-congressional items. We did not want the tightness of this year's bill to work inordinately against the Library of Congress, which is, I think, uh, an important institution for all Americans. And so while we have treated the CRS similarly to the other support agencies, as I've indicated, we have allowed for some increasing funding for the library. 3.2 million for reducing cataloging rearage, an ongoing program at the library which we've been supportive of. 3.2 million more for secondary storage facilities they're bulging at the seams and need to find places to uh, place their uh, manuscripts, materials, and books. $960,000 for the talking book machines and the books for the blind program. And $2 million for depository libraries, which of course serve our constituencies. And are a major uh, and significant way for us to convey information about what's happening in government uh, to uh, people across the country. There are a few legislative provisions that I think need to be mentioned. We repeal the two-page limit on newsletters. This was a request made of us by Mr. Wolf of Virginia. It's our feeling that um, now that members are limited in what they can spend to produce and mail their newsletters, they ought to be able to operate on their own and not be uh, given a great deal of detail on how they do it. We rescind the authority for members to make mass mailings beyond district lines. This was done to accommodate the vote that we've made on the House floor at least on two occasions. Mr. Thomas is here, I'm sure, to mention that further. I might add we want to accommodate Mr. Thomas. We included this here in the uh, language of the bill to do so, and we're certainly willing to cooperate with him in any detail he's interested in providing the committee so that we can indeed find common ground. We establish revolving funds for the deposit of members' fees for using the attending physician and the House gym, thereby completing the necessary legislation to do away with or limit those two so-called perks that members have enjoyed. Authority for the House daycare center to carry over tuition payments and other receipts if they have a surplus is granted on a year-to-year -year basis. There are several housekeeping provisions that expedite the operations of the House and other agencies, flex time, transfer authority, car emergencies and garages, a lot of minutia, which is included in this, just as we always do. I'm requesting a rule which will waive points of order against provisions based on clause two and uh, rules and clauses two and six of rule 21 of the House. The committee has also asked that the rule provide for an orderly consideration of this measure. 
I think we all understand that uh, this, perhaps uh, like many other years, we could consume hours and hours, including possibly days of time on the floor because members have such a intense and continuing interest in the work of the legislative branch. It's ironic, I might point out, that the defense appropriations bill usually passes in a fraction of the time that we take for this measure. So uh, I would have to wonder whether all of the interested amenders and others who play so much stock in the politics of this bill really have their priorities straight. But let me just simply say that I do think orderly consideration to this measure so that we might be able to conclude it sometime tomorrow would be in the interests of the, uh, the House in general. I want to thank uh, you and the committee, Mr. Chairman, for, for hearing me out. Uh, I do want to simply say that uh, we do understand that this is a tight year, and we've come with a bill that's as tight as any, I think, has been offered, certainly in the memory of most of us. We've done it because uh, the budget resolution asked us to do it, because in a period when deficits are high, we want to set an example. I'm hopeful this bill will be an example to other bills that come along afterwards, particularly uh, in analogous areas of the executive branch budgets. So I'm very much uh, hopeful that the committee will uh, allow us to proceed tomorrow with uh, some amendments, but uh, perhaps amendments that are representative of the general concerns that members have without necessarily all the minutia, some of which should be, as uh, Mr. Solomon indicated, the work of the House Administration Committee, and some of which should generally think uh, be considered in the context of the Hamilton Gratison legislation which just passed the House the other day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it is uh, a pleasure to appear before you. I, I must uh, candidly say that I do appear, however, with some reservation relative to uh, the, the, the normal role that I play when presenting this bill. The, the legislative branch bill, as my chairman has indicated, uh, is, is a very conservative bill relative to where we have been. This is the second year in a row in which uh, actual outlays uh, uh, will be below or proposed below uh, the year before. Uh, that's a pattern that is a healthy pattern for all of our appropriations process, I believe. I don't want to imply by that uh, that, that if, if I were running the committee or the, my party were running the place that that this bill would be nearly as large as it, as it is today. There are elements of the appropriations in this process that I think are excessive and, and that we could do a lot more about. But my chairman has been very cooperative with us in the last several years, particularly this year, uh, allowing us to provide a good deal of input regarding areas that do need to be restrained. The reservation that I have, Mr. Chairman, is, that is uh, very much one that falls in line with the comments of Mr. Solomon. Uh, to, to begin a pattern of uh, limiting uh, rules that affect an appropriations bill uh, is a precedent that itself is uh, uh, very delicate, if not dangerous. It seems to me that uh, the one point that is often left out is that we don't have a, a policy bill on the floor uh, that, that, is allowed to, that has allowed the members to exercise themselves in terms of policy amendments. Uh, well, normally I would strongly support the idea that, uh, that amendments to a bill like this should address themselves strictly to funding. Uh, it, it should be understood that this, this bill does represent uh, the members' opportunity to speak about their own body on the floor. It's their chance to express themselves relative to concerns about the way the House is being run. And, and, and it's uh, probably as a result of that very natural that we spend a good deal of time on this bill, even though it's small proportionate to other bills uh, insofar as appropriations are concerned. I have uh, uh, spent a lot of time with my own members uh, who are interested in providing uh, some ideas about how much money we should spend in the appropriations uh, for the legislative branch. Uh, I, I particularly have worked with uh, Congressman Klug uh, along with Congressman Sweat in an amendment uh, that they've carefully worked with my staff. I have uh, in fact, a statement here for the record from Scott Klug, since he's at home and not able to be here today for, for this, uh, for, uh, in order to testify himself. Uh, Lamar Smith and George Allen, uh, Congressman Holloway, uh, the, the Gang of Seven have all provided input to us. Our staffs have co cooperated, cooperated uh, <coughs> extensively in terms of trying to help them with their amendments. I would suggest that where uh, those amendments do address 
alteration of dollars being spent for the legislative branch. It's very appropriate that those members be able to be heard on the floor. From there, we will take the direction of the Rules Committee. We appreciate the cooperation we've had uh, from you and, and your members in the past. Look forward to continuing working with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions of the panel? Mr. Solomon. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, let me uh, first commend uh, both of my classmates. You both came here about the same time, I think, a long time ago. You fellows have aged. Um, <laughs> This committee will do it to you, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, I, I, I don't envy you. Uh, so will this committee, by the way. My water uh, doesn't do the same thing. Uh, like uh, uh, you heard my, me question the, uh, the need to come before the Rules Committee uh, in the first place. And uh, I had mentioned that this is the first time in, in the 14 years that I can remember, and going back even further, uh, that we've ever had to come here. And I'm not here to argue for members uh, to be able to offer amendments to, uh, uh, to legislate in an appropriation bill, uh, to offer non-germane amendments. Uh, I'd be hypocritical if I did that because I criticize sometime your Appropriations Committee for doing that in committee. Uh, and then having to come for us uh, before us for waivers, and I think that somehow, sometimes that's how we got into this red ink mess we're in. Sometimes when when the appropriation uh, committee authorizes things that haven't been authorized by the by the authorizing committees, but I, I really don't think we ought to prevent members from being able to work their will on the floor under normal rules of the house, regular process. And that means if someone wants to add something to your bill, they ought to have the right to do it. And the House ought to have the right to turn it down or approve it. By the same token, I think any member ought to have the opportunity to, to offer cutting amendments to uh, uh, whatever he or she may wish. And, you know, we, there was concern that there could be two or three or four hundred amendments out there. Now, with the pre-filing requirement, I think uh, there were 30 timely amendments. And of those 30, 30 timely amendments, uh, only about half of them or so uh, were really uh, allowable under the, under the regular process. The rest of them were, again, legislating in an appropriation bill or non-germane amendments. Now, just for example, uh, I don't see anything wrong with the House voting on amendments like uh, the Holloway Amendment provides for a 5% cut in funding for standing and expenses of standing committees, special and select. 5% cut. Uh, Mr. Roberts has an amendment uh, to eliminate uh, mileage for members' accounts. I mean, that's something we could, uh, uh, it is germane. It doesn't require any waivers. We ought to be able to vote on that. Uh, Mr. Santorum has uh, some good amendments. Mr. Smith of Texas has a very good one, which uh, reduces funding for legislative branch overhead in areas such as travel, supplies, and materials by 10%. Now, this is a question of policy, and Vic, you mentioned that uh, a lot of this is the jurisdiction of the House Administration Committee, and we have Bill Thomas, the ranking member over here, uh, who's probably going to have something to say about that. But we really ought to be able to work our will on the floor on this, and uh, that's why I think just a straight open rule, uh, which doesn't waive any, any, uh, anything and doesn't make any uh, 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 non-germane amendments in order, but lets the House work its will, I think that's the way we ought to operate. It's the way we've operated for, for 14 years that I know of and probably a lot more. So um, I'd just be interested in your comment of why, why you're here. Well, first of all, we have come to this committee uh, in the past. It has not always been our practice, but we have in recent years, last couple of years, I think we were here several years ago. Periodically, we have come to the committee. And just as an appropriator, I might say that while I think generally we all wish that everything we appropriated were authorized, we've often carried the ball for a lot of authorizing committees on the Appropriations yep. Committee with everyone's tacit understanding and, I give you great and approval. Credit for it. <laughs> and a lot of what we've done in recent years uh, has been to carry some of the work of the House Administration Committee without requiring them to come to the floor frequently to take care of rather minor matters. But we are very careful not to in invade their uh, primacy. And I think you can see from my comments, the only time we have done so is when we think we are fulfilling the wishes of the, of the broad membership and certainly hope we have the approval of House administration to do it. Mr. Thomas's language, for example, which we passed twice, ought to be found uh, possible to enact in some manner. 
I would just simply say that I think there are a number of these amendments that have been offered that are really duplicative. There are three on uh, select committees. There are several on the LSOs, uh, several on the Joint Committee on Printing. I mean, there are a number across the board. Uh, you, can, you can really find a way, I think, in a rule that would give the members a feel for a cross-section of these amendments without necessarily having us stay on the floor for several days uh, debating it at, at, at length, uh, amendments that really are very similar to others that were offered. I think the committee did us all a great favor by allowing uh, those serious uh, members who've been working on these issues to bring them to the committee and gather them all up because sometimes what I think I've seen on the floor is simply people sparking off other people and uh, offering amendments to amendments or similar amendments. We sometimes slice these across the board amendments by half percent reductions. I don't think that really adds anything to the basic uh, process of legislating. So I think the committee has uh, some options here. And I'm going to leave it to you to decide uh, which you want to bring to the floor. I'm prepared to uh, argue for the bill as we brought it to you. I think in uh, most cases, these amendments, um, however well motivated, uh, really would do a tremendous amount of damage. But that's up to the members to decide. There are some, however, that I think would be helpful. And I will, uh, you know, I would particularly uh, like to cite the amendment offered by Mr. Sweat, which uh, Mr. Lewis has mentioned that. Congressman Klug is co-sponsoring because I think it does constructively remove the amount of money that was left in the 1991 account, remove any question about whether that's available for any nefarious purpose. It does bring us to a point where the only funds remaining for us to uh, work with are in the 92 year where all the bills have yet to come in or in the 93 bill before you. So there are some constructive amendments here and I hope the committee will make them in order. But there are many others that I think uh, have been around for eons. If we don't have an elevator operator amendment in this bill, you know, I, I think the building probably will continue to stand. But it, it would be a shock for any of us uh, to go by a season in the ledge branch without someone raising that absolutely essential matter. Hmm. And we all, remember good, we, we all remember good old Silvio Conti. Yes, uh, we do. Jerry? Mr. Solomon, I, I very much appreciate your comment. It, it's the precedent that you speak to that, that is very important. We don't want to find ourselves in a pattern of uh, using rules to limit the appropriations process for it's so fundamental to our getting a handle on control uh, and control over the spending that, that is our major challenge in the country today. Uh, but by way of this bill, I would urge you, but I'd also urge the chairman to, to keep in mind that other element. Uh, this bill does represent the people's body, but it is the institution that, that members are elected to run in part. And so if they exercise themselves by way of amendment uh, in this process on this bill, it's because of that very unique and very special circumstance. So uh, while I, I frankly don't want to see us spend three days on this bill, I think you can appreciate why the members in, in a very special way address themselves to the legislative appropriations bill on the floor. Well, as the gentleman uh, knows, I, I really do have great respect for both of you. You, you have two of the toughest jobs in the Congress. Um, I would just say to my good friend, Mr. Fazio, that yes, there are duplications. Uh, the duplications are caused by the pre-filing and members not knowing what amendments are going to be filed or, or to be allowed. And, um, and as far as your statement on uh, uh, it's not the first time you come, you've come before the committee, uh, that's true. But I think all the other times you were asking for waivers for legislating and appropriation bills, et cetera, not to limit cutting or, or adding uh, amendments. And uh, that's the precedent that Mr. Lewis speaks of that I'm so concerned about. I appreciate your coming. I won't take up any more of your time. Mr. Frost. One question, and I think this is, uh, Mr. Fazio, is really addressed to, uh, to both you and, and Mr. Thomas. Um, on the uh, effective date on the district mailing uh, amendment, uh, making that uh, date of enactment uh, versus October 1, this is an amendment I think that you and Mr. Thomas are both suggesting. Yeah. Um, what, were, what would occur if um, this bill is not uh, passed as a separate piece of legislation, but rather uh, becomes part of a continuing resolution? Well, of course, that date is likely to slip well into October or November. Um, it's mostly an immaterial debate anyway, because the prohibition about sending mail 
has occurred 60 days before the November. Uh, That's right. Uh, Tuesday first. So we're talking about being into September. I would think at best if this bill were signed ahead of time. So I don't know that there's a major distinction, but I certainly... That's what, that's what struck me in, yes. in reading the amendment, that it's a distinction without a difference almost. Exactly. That's the phrase, and I think Mr. Thomas and I uh, both have the same intent, and I'm simply um, wanting to accommodate the main author of the provision. Yeah, that's, that's the only question that I have. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is difficult. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have my mic on now. It's a very difficult decision to make to limit the debate on this measure as well as the amendment. Because as Mr. Lewis said, and you've indicated, this is the people's body. They should have the right to control their expenses and the funds involved. And admittedly, some would want to do away with about everything. I'm not sure, Mr. Quillen, they really want to do away with it, but they'd like a vote on it. Well, maybe that's the uh, <laughs> correct analogy of it, but uh, there'd be an argument on the floor, but I think reason and good judgment would prevail at the end because funds have to be made available for the operation of the House of Representatives. We know that. Committee structure, admittedly, is too large, should be reduced, but as long as we have, the committees has now uh, uh, it's now constituted, we've got to fund it. So let's be reasonable. Let's don't uh, report a bill down to the floor that's going to take forever. On the at the same time, I think if an open rule were granted, the members would use logic. They would not take uh, as long as we would feel, because I think uh, in good judgment they, they would limit their amendments and their debate knowing that we have to get something done. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Quillen. Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, I just want to uh, thank the committee, especially Vic and his staff, um, for a tremendous job. I, I can't imagine uh, being the, the chairman of this committee and uh, having to weigh all the different difficult situations that have come up. But you have cut in every area that I can see here. And uh, to me, it looks like a very lean budget. And um, I really congratulate you and Mr. Lewis and your staff and doing the best you can to work with a very, very difficult budget. As a member of the Rules Committee, I. I don't have any problem with allowing amendments to be listed beforehand. Um, I think it's a good idea. I wish we would do more of it in the Rules Committee, especially members like yourself that have to present and, and take the responsibility for this uh, legislative branch appropriation. I think it would be very wise for us to continue to do this even more in the future because it enables you to be prepared for the amendments that come up to be able to respond to them. Because uh, amendments, can, uh, amendments that you're not aware of can be very cutting, they can be very hurting without really uh, looking at them beforehand. I, I would hope in the Rules Committee, I've always felt this way as long as I've been on here, that we would do more of this. Mm -hmm. But um, So I'm glad that we are having amendments listed. And I appreciate the work you've done on this committee. If I might just comment, uh, you know, I didn't cite in my introductory comments my remarks that I've submitted, but, uh, you know, there are some 2,200 authorized jobs that are eliminated in this bill. And we have not seen, by the way, despite uh, some inaccurate rhetoric to the contrary, any increase in the number of people working in the legislative branch since I've been chairman over the last decade. Um, I particularly wanted to, to say, though, in response to your, your statement, we don't bring a bill to the floor to be cut. I'm not uh, playing games here in the sense that we bring something that we understand members want to cut in order not only to look good uh, at home where the legislative branch never can rank high in popularity. Uh, we bring the bill that we think is the best bill we can bring. It is not a cut that we don't think will be painful. We meant it to be. We think it's appropriate. 
On the other hand, to cut further could really undermine the ability of this very important branch of government to perform its constitutional requirements. And so, you know, it could be uh, more popular if we brought a bill out that was, say, frozen and then asked people to cut it from that level. Uh, we didn't do that. Maybe uh, politically uh, we're a little naive and old-fashioned, but we've done what we think is a service to the members by listening to them and to accommodating their bipartisan concerns in the way we put the bill together in the first place. Would my friend from Ohio yield for just a moment? Thank you. You, you touched on this, Vic, Jerry, but uh, I had hoped that you'd have put it in your opening statement as well. Uh, it is true, is it not, as you just stated, that over the past decade or so, the total amount of, of uh, positions, people working for the legislative branch has remained about constant? That's right. In fact, I will make uh, some opening remarks on this bill. I wish you would. I mean, that's something that. people ought to know. Um, parts of the federal government have grown over the past decade or so, especially the executive branch, although not nearly so much as some people would like to believe. Uh, local and municipal governments, I mean, state and, and municipal governments have grown by about a factor of three or so over the past couple of decades. The federal government has not grown overall. This, our particular part of it, has not grown at all over the past decade. So, you know, even though people may not hold us in great repute at the moment or, or whatever, they should know, they're entitled to know that in fact we have held the line with respect to our own employees. And I think that's just something that should be emphasized over and over again. Doesn't mean we've done the best job possible, but it does mean we've done a much better job than any other branch of this government and much better job than all of the branches of other levels of government in this country. There was a period in the mid-70s when the uh, Budget Act was passed and there was an expansion with CBO's creation, the Budget Committee's creation. There was a period when uh, we did see an increase in the number of legislative branch employees. But since that period has passed in the late 70s and to the present time, uh, it's been very flat. And I will make that very clear in my opening comments. It would also be useful, if I may say so, Mr. Chairman, if I may just one more moment, for you to describe, if you'd like, very briefly now, certainly on the floor, uh, the situation with respect to, to Frank Mail. I mean, I mean, it is now, in fact, it has now, in fact, been reduced over the past couple of years, as I understand that's, it. In the right. old days, it didn't make an awful lot of difference. We always had to pay the money one way or another. But now that individual members have their own accounts and are accountable for what they mail, uh, as this member understands it, at least we have a, a real limit for the first time ever on the amount of Frank Mail. Members should understand that, too. That's correct. In fact, uh, Mr. Frenzel and I uh, worked through some legislation which as it passed, uh, almost overwhelmingly, was at the same time highly unpopular because it did away with this uh, practice of being able to vote to cut as we did in every legislative branch bill and yet continue to mail. And the very people who were voting to cut were mailing as much or more than the average. Now we have now... An Interesting an article in today's roll call. Well, I, I, I know that may be cited on the floor, but uh, my, my point is simple. Every member has an amount of money to mail which is equal to each other's based on the population of their district. And of course at the beginning of the decade they're almost flat e even across the board. What I think uh, is important for the members to note is that uh, cuts in mailing from now on will come directly out of the House mailing account just as you would count reductions in clerk hire or office expenses. This would come off each member's equivalent ability to mail. And, of course, we have restricted the ability to mail greatly to the point where Mr. Lewis and I working together this year were able to rescind, working with the Senate as well, $40 million in uh, mail that had been appropriated but we did not need to uh, expend or obligate. We have come down significantly from the estimated amount this year, some $30 million, over what was originally likely to be spent in this fiscal year. And the savings, when aggregated back a little further are uh, very sizable and I think uh, they really frankly have allowed this bill to be reduced and yet not to do a lot of damage to the institution. There were some people who were abusing the Frank and giving all of us I think a harder and harder time to justify its usage and at the same time a harder time to put a decent bill together on an annual basis. Well, those are important facts and I thank the chairman for bringing them to our attention. I thank my colleague for for yielding to me for and a Mr. Chairman, minutes. if I could add, I, I must uh, I, I must say, uh, Mr. Elinson, while you and I very much agree uh, uh, about almost everything relative to the institution, I, I don't want to mislead you either. There, there's little, uh, little question that while we have put limitations on the franc and we have cut back postal patrons and the like, 
There are very few members, if any, who would suggest there are not resources enough to mail as much as they possibly could to their individual district. The use of the computer, the uh, allocation of mail by way of bulk rate because uh, the mail is sent out in a, in a, in a a carefully developed fashion allows people to mail as, as much as they might ever want to mail. And that does have a big impact upon uh, incumbency, that is the re-election of all of us. Uh, and, and in, in reality, uh, there's no doubt that each member of the House sits with a, a sizable uh, and significant asset that, that is by way of the franc. Uh, while we have tried to put careful limitations on access, there certainly is plenty of resource available for those who choose to mail, and they can do so as uh, almost as much as they would choose. And of course, it's available to the public on a quarterly basis, and of course, as a result, we read about it frequently in roll call and Correct. ultimately in the wire services in our local papers. And that may, in some cases, serve to restrain members' appetite. In fact, I think you can find over time that there is going to be a declining amount of usage that was in prior years described as an abuse. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to join in extending my appreciation to these gentlemen. And I do so uh, by saying, as others have, that I would never want to be sitting at the table where you are having to deal with the situation that you're, uh, you're faced with. We were too young and naive when the opportunity came to us uh -huh. to understand your uh -huh. current point of view. Mm -hmm. And now we're institutionalized. Isn't Unlike it? my colleague, Mr. Solomon, I've watched all of you over that, both of you over the 14-year period, and I don't think you've aged a day. Let me say that uh, there are a few Some of things that I think do need to, to, to raise here. Uh, I know that you're aware of the uh, delicacy of this issue in this institution, and you're also aware of the, the level of frustration now, Vic, you said that some members would like to have a vote, but they wouldn't necessarily like to be successful uh, on the votes that they would propose to, the measures they would propose to bring about these cuts. But I will say that, that frankly, as, as we have just heard from Tony about the, the fact that we have not had a, a growth in the size of the staff here in this institution over the past decade, when one goes back to look at the decisions that were made in the mid-1960s following the election of President Johnson and the defeat of, of, uh, of uh, Barry Goldwater and uh, the tremendous change that took place in this institution then, you can see that at that point there was a dramatic change in the role that a member of Congress had and the size of the staff. Uh, I was thinking as we were talking about this growth of, of a visitor who came to my office about two years ago. Uh, he was uh, elected to the Congress in the 1940s and uh, was elected President of the United States in 1968. I'm talking about Richard Nixon who came to my office and was absolutely flabbergasted to see that he said, well, when I was here, he said, uh, I had uh, um, one man who worked in my office and two secretaries. And uh, he said, how many people are you allowed to have? And I said, well, Mr. President, I'm allowed to have 18 full-time staff members and four part-time staff members. And he said, uh, and how often do you go home? And I said, well, I, I try to get to California almost every weekend to stay in touch with the people whom I represent. And he said, we were allowed to go back twice a year. I guess uh, what I'm saying is that, well, in the last decade, we haven't seen a tremendous increase. But certainly in the, the two decades that preceded that, there were great changes in the makeup of this institution. And uh, one question that I would pose, we get all these different figures. Last night I watched uh, the author of, uh, of that book, Kill Rat, John Jackley, on uh, C-SPAN, the Book Notes program, and he said that there are between 11 and 18,000 staff members on Capitol Hill. I remember one time hearing that it was, I guess, with uh, the uh, CBO and all, we, it was as high as 38,000. What exactly are the numbers now of total staff members, and I guess that would include the Capitol Police and all that are in this institution? David, I'd have to provide that for the record, you know, that level of detail. I'm sure yeah. I can do it either now in your record or on the floor. But, you know, when you look at the legislative branch with all its uh, uh, ancillary institutions as well as the members' own personal situation, um, it is fairly flat. 
In fact, we have had reductions that compensate for increases, and they've been minor. For example, this year, I think we were asked to add 450 people, and I, asked, I added three, all of whom were paid for by the copyright fees at the Library of Congress, mm -hmm. but which were needed in order to process more rapidly the work of the Copyright Office, which, as you know, is important to the computer industry and the, the entertainment industry and so many others that are important to not only the country but our state. Um, we really haven't been willing to give people, even in committees like the Joint Committee on Taxation, for example, or the CBO, which are under tremendous pressure to do more and do it faster, mm -hmm. uh, the people that they say they need. We just tell them to increase their productivity. Mr. Uh, Lombard, my able staff, says that the, uh, the total legislative branch uh, is, what, 38,000, a little over, in, uh, in total employees. Mm -hmm. 38.6 in 1978, when I uh, was first elected, along with a number of us, it was 38.7 thousand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've actually gone down a small fraction. That is an interesting number, Vic. And I, the, the thing that, that throws me is a number of us have the privilege of serving uh, on interparliamentary uh, conferences with uh, our counterparts in other parts of the world. And I was told that the second largest legislative branch staff was in Canada and that they have 3,000 employees total. So, I mean, there's a Well, it's a very different uh, kind of legislative institution, as mm -hmm. you know, in a parliamentary system. In mm -hmm. effect, the committee chairman right. or the ministers running various agencies, right. our cabinet equivalents. So, all, all I'm you know, there's saying a is much there, different way of I understand that, but I mean, there still is a pretty significant split. I'd be happy to yield to my friend I from Tennessee. What, what you had asked for a breakdown for category, you just got the overall number. And I think what that doesn't demonstrate is of that, well, of the 38,000, I suspect a large portion of those are with the Library of Congress that don't really serve directly uh, the Congress, but rather they serve the public at large and, mm -hmm. and serve uh, the mm -hmm. needs of the public. Well, I like to think that we're all here to serve the public at large. Well, but certainly, but I think what you were relating to in relationship to the legislative branch in Canada and elsewhere were those that were directly related mm -hmm. to the legislative process, mm -hmm. where the Library of Congress maybe has 1% of their energy goes to the legislative process, 99% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. goes to collecting books uh, in whatever for, for the nation. So, I don't know what yeah. the, do those figures relate, what really goes to the legislative <coughs> process. And we have many people at the government printing office and at the general accounting office. I mean, not serving. Well, all I'm the saying is, is it is a pretty a wide gap body. between the second largest parliamentary staff in the world at, at 3,000, ours at 38,600, or even as it was 15 years ago, 38,700. Yeah. It just seems to me that. that I mean, I would like to think that we could follow the trend that started in 1978 of reducing by 100 uh, that overall number. I just... Uh, well, what is the Canadian population? About 10 percent of ours? Uh, even when you have to assume yeah. that all the people working for the ministers are mm -hmm. political appointees mm -hmm. doing the same kinds of things they'd be doing if they were working for a committee here. Mm -hmm. You're not that far out of line in terms of the population of the country. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, yield. Be happy to yield to the distinguished chairman. I've been told, I can't verify it, that the entire staffing of the Canadian Health Service is far less than the, the, the health, the staffing of the Massachusetts Blue Cross Blue Shield. Hmm. So, I mean, they probably got some kind of formula up there. Yeah, maybe we have The gentleman would yield. Yeah, happy to yield. Happy. Uh, I, I very much appreciate the gentleman's comments. It's important uh, that, that we, as well as the public, focus upon the fact that that we do have a very sizable number of employees associated with the legislative branch. Admittedly, uh, a very high number of those do work for the government printing office and for the Library of Congress, et cetera. Nonetheless, there is a very broadly based support group uh, here right within these halls that is, that is servicing the elected members of Congress. My chairman indicated that, that if this bill is implemented in its present form, there will be uh, an, an essentially a reduction of in the neighborhood of over 2,000 employees, which is a pretty good whack going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. but, but nonetheless, I have been very concerned with what has happened with our committees, for example, over time, with some committees being very restrained in the way they handle investigative staff and, and the growth there. Uh, others uh, being rather excessive over the last several decades. And indeed, uh, from time to time, we need to review that and, and get tough on those that have been excessive. In this bill, there's some attempt to do that. 
I, I might say further that it, it seems to me that the legislative branch might even function better if we continue on a path that reduces our numbers. I mean, mm -hmm. it is kind of difficult in some of these offices to walk around. You're, you're stumbling over each other, staff members are, uh, because of the lack of space. Uh, the, the staff has become so sizable. You're absolutely correct, and I think that's something that has, has frustrated many of us. Then if you take it one step further and realize, Vic, that many of these amendments that are going to be before us today and which would have been offered on the floor if we'd had gone through the normal procedure uh, will emanate from the minority side. And one of the main reasons for that is that there is a disproportionate uh, representation on minority staff to the majority staff uh, even as it compares to the to the makeup of this institution, I should go on record right now congratulating Chairman Moakley for the fact that he is one of the very few committee chairmen in this institution to submit uh, a zero increase in uh, in staffing. Uh, and I wish that some of the other committees would follow that example. And I hope very much that we could have a, a better balance when it comes to those of us uh, in the minority on staff juxtaposed to the majority, because that's something that has uh, uh, you know, played a role in enhancing the level of frustration. So I thank you for your work. I, uh, I will tell you that, that uh, I'm going to push to ensure that every member who wants to have uh, an amendment, which certainly is germane, I'm not going to, like my friend from uh, New York, uh, encourage legislating in an appropriations bill, but I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to ensure that we have the right on the floor of the House to bring about the kinds of reductions that some of us think would be a responsible approach to try and meet the concerns which the American people have. Oh, and also uh, I should say that Mr. Solomon was part of that effort to ensure that there was a zero <laughs> increase in the budget uh, in the number of staff. Yeah, I ha have to say that, and uh, I'm embarrassed to say that Mr. Solomon had to remind me of it. But. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Gordon. Well, these are, are difficult economic times in our country, and uh, I think virtually every family and business in all of our districts are having to cut back now, live within budgets, uh, and be responsible. Uh, and uh, I congratulate you on taking the lead uh, here in the legislative branch of appropriation and doing the same. And I think as leaders of the country, we need to be doing that. I congratulate you on, on reducing the frank mail dramatically over the last two or three years. I congratulate you on, on reducing the budget by over 5% and approaching probably will be over 6% before we're through. I think that shows the type of leadership that, that we need to here in Washington. Uh, families are doing it at home, and we need to do it uh, here. And uh, thank you for bringing this kind of bill to us. Thank you, Bart. Thank you, Bart. Ms. Slaughter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to add my thanks to these two gentlemen. I, I know that um, in the six years that I've served here, I've watched them suffer with this year after year. <laughs> and I just do want to say that I agree with what Vic said, that an awful lot of people want to vote on the floor for something that they fervently pray with all their heart and soul will never pass. And so I am happy uh, that you cut the hypocrisy level here a little bit too when you made those changes in franking and I think that you, you raised the level of debate by doing that and I'm very grateful to you for it. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Mr. McEwen. My question would be, I remember in 1981 there were only 34 democracies. Other than India, how many legislatures are there that are representative around the, the world? And if so, what size country and people do they represent? I know the British represent about, about 50,000 per parliamentarian. Just wondered, uh, I, may, maybe, maybe Americans have too much representation. Maybe I just... I think we've... Gentleman Neal, yeah. I don't think there's anybody that's as large as us with the same type of government. Yeah, I, don't th I don't think there is either. And 600,000 people is, is, I know of nothing to compare. I don't to. know about the Indian Parliament. It might be that the, uh, they have more members, but uh, I think their district still may be larger than ours on average. But, you know, I think part of uh, my response to you, as would be to Mr. Dreyer, is that uh, with the growth of government, and you can cite different eras when that occurred, certainly the 60s. Um, our staff increases have really been increasingly designed to accommodate the role of ombudsman, ombudsman uh, playing the role of, uh, 
a buffer between the executive branch and the people. Problem solving for individuals and communities, I'm sure it takes up the vast majority of the amount of time that uh, our staff expend. And typically that is not an eight or nine hour day. That's a long day and a long week. And they're doing it because I think um, the legislative branch has, has had to play that role. Uh, and I think, uh, frankly, uh, people have the impression that we're doing it because we want to put out more press releases or do something that would inure to our own benefit. But I really believe that uh, we can take a lot of pride in the work that our staff uh, do for us and, more importantly, for the people we represent on a very fundamental level. And I'm always astounded by people who are complaining that we didn't solve a case that they brought to us or didn't get a letter back to them within uh, uh, two weeks or something along those lines and yet at the same time think that we have too many staff. Um, I know, as I'm sure in your case, the people we have, the 18 to 22 people who are working, are putting long, hard hours in to accommodate the, the immediate and direct needs of the people we represent. And I think that's what they really have come to appreciate and expect. They have no place else. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, Mr. Cohen. Uh, under your committee, do you, funds come for special prosecutors? Uh, no, we would, we would uh, come, I'm sure, for special funding on these matters uh, if we had anything of that sort that needed to come. Well, there uh, are special prosecutors. Mm -hmm. Rand Contra mm -hmm. now investigating uh, about everything. It looks to me like that'd be one way we could save money by abolishing yeah. all those committees. Now, we have provided special funds for, for hearings, but we've not provided them for special prosecutors. Well, who does that? Commerce, Justice, State, uh, The executive uh, through the Justice Department would be the appropriate place. Anytime we've had a controversy, I want to make this clear about the work of any select committee, special committee, anything that was deemed to be highly partisan, we have not used the reprogramming authority to provide that funding. Mr. Lewis and I have agreed on all the reprogrammings that have taken place or they haven't taken place. And certainly we understand the comedy involved in not forcing the minority to agree to fund things that they uh, oppose strongly without a vote on the floor. Well, it just occurred to me that that's one avenue Congress really should abolish save a lot of money. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Gentlemen, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if, if I might, uh, I, I'd just like to say for the record that, that the courtesy with which we've been uh, treated to by you and by your staff, the members of the Rules Committee, can only be exceeded by the courtesy whereby I'm treated by my chairman and our committee. Thank you, Mr. Don't, chairman. Don't leave Mr. Solomon out again. I, all the time. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Far be it from me. Okay. The two of us thank the two of you. Thank you. And we look forward to the same sort of treatment on the floor tomorrow. Sure. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the Honorable William Thomas. Ranking member of the House Administration Committee. That's right. Mr. Chairman. Bill. And the ranking gentleman from New York, Mr. Solomon. Uh, I have high hopes that this is the last time I will appear before you on this issue. Uh, as you might recall, I've been in front of you several times dealing with a, a bill which is numbered H.R. 4104, uh, dealing with franking and allowing members to uh, frank mail uh, outside their district to people that they do not represent nor have they ever represented. You might recall that the legislation was attached to the uh, campaign uh, finance limitation bill, uh, primarily to be used as a vehicle to deal with the House Senate problem. Uh, I understand that the legislative appropriation amendment which was uh, placed in the bill uh, to allow the effective H.R. 4104 uh, to become reality had inadvertently placed on it the kind of boilerplate date requirements of October 1. Uh, and that the chairman's intent uh, is to remove the October 1 date, thereby making it effective on date of enactment. Uh, I understand the gentleman from Texas is concerned about that, but it would seem to me uh, that a measure which was introduced on the first day 
uh, of this uh, year, first day of Congress, of this session, uh, designed to stop a practice before it became widespread uh, certainly should end uh, before the first day of the fiscal year, which is 30 days after the already enacted cutoff would occur. Uh, not only would that be closing the barn door uh, after all the cows were gone, but you could have picked up the entire uh, contents of the barn and moved it as well by that date. Uh, and so by putting in date of enactment, it, it seems to me that it at least will communicate to people that it will be done as soon as possible in this particular vehicle. I still would hope that the committees of jurisdiction, House Administration uh, and Post Office would move the legislation as a standalone bill so that we could affect that change uh, even sooner. Uh, I can assure you that I will continue to pursue every possible angle to make sure that the wooden stake is in the heart uh, of the franking monster, uh, but at the very least we ought to make sure that the most um, uh, efficient, uh, efficient date uh, would be used in the legislative appropriation bill. Uh, I might, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the record indicate that even as recently as yesterday, uh, major new uh, major newspapers were continuing to editorialize uh, in favor of making this change. This is a, a New York Times editorial, and I would uh, ask unanimous consent Without to objection. place that in the record. I'm tempted to try to slip in the March 30th Boston Globe uh, editorial once again, but I won't. Uh, we now have 94 current members. Uh, co-sponsoring this measure, and it seems as uh, though the uh, longer we go with cutoffs to primary, uh, the more members who seem anxious to co-sponsor uh, the legislation. Uh, I just hope that the race to get co-sponsors and the race to have any time left to apply the measure um, don't wind up neck and neck. Finally, Mr. Chairman, uh, to indicate the kind of hypocrisy that we're operating under, and I mean this in all seriousness, there has been a challenge by a taxpayer a group, Coalition to End the Permanent Congress, uh, to deny um, members the use of the franc uh, failing to pass the legislation. And in the House's defense, uh, in the defense of the House's position to mail, on pages 29 and 30 of their brief, uh, Professor Albert D. Cover is quoted in terms of the impact of franking. Uh, he indicates, quote, I am aware of no other political scientist who has studied this field more than I have with my co-author and students. So he is a self-appointed uh, primary expert uh, in the field, and I have no doubt to quarrel, uh, to quarrel with that statement. But it's quoted, please listen carefully, in a hypothetical district with 50% of the constituents identifying with the incumbent's party and 50% with the other party, the immediate impact of a mailing would be to increase the incumbent's vote by 7.6 percentage points. Again, that would fall over time to 6.9 and 6.5 points after two and three months. Um, the point to make is that with our 60-day cutoff period, if in fact that was utilized by incumbents, that would still be a 6.9 or roughly a 7 point uh, advantage uh, percentage wise. Uh, in this particular political climate, there are a number of individuals who would prefer a 7 point advantage. In the 1990 election, there were 28 members uh, who had election contests that were closer than a 7% swing, win or lose. I have a feeling that in this particular election year, uh, there will be a higher number than 28. And it seems to me that if even the academic experts are saying that this has an impact on elections, and if it's clearly the practice of incumbents to mail far more often and more heavily in election years, then incumbents also know it's an unfair advantage. <coughs> that if this House continues to stonewall legislation which would not allow members to send mail to people they don't even represent, that the level of respect for Congress may not go up, but it won't continue to go down. 
and I urge uh, this committee to make an order the amendment that would change the effective date from October 1 to uh, upon enactment. Thank, Thank you, you Chair. Mr. Thomas. Mr. Frost. Mr. Thomas, uh, you have been uh, dogged in your, uh, your effort in this, and I think you are about to be rewarded uh, for your perseverance. Uh, I think members uh, should realize that um, this change, of course, uh, reaches far beyond this year. And um, assuming you're successful, uh, the change will have consequences in the next session of Congress also. There is a, uh, there is a Supreme Court case pending right now, case uh, pending, uh, excuse me, in the federal courts, not it hasn't reached the Supreme Court yet, which deals with the question of uh, the potential undercount of the United States Census. If the federal courts uh, decide that there was an undercount, and uh, if the Supreme Court upholds that decision, it is certainly possible that there will be, and if the courts require a statistical adjustment, uh, be made to compensate for that undercount. It is certainly possible that there will be a complete uh, new round of redistricting in uh, 1993, which would affect, uh, if not every state, uh, affect a number of states. So that assuming your legislation is successful, even if it comes after the, comes too late to affect matters this year, uh, it certainly will have an impact next year. And uh, uh, you have been uh, uh, you have been the champion of this legislation. Uh, you, uh, uh, you managed to pass it by a large margin on the floor of the House. So the House has spoken on this matter. And uh, I think it, uh, your legislation will become law, one way or the other. I thank the gentleman for his comments. One of the more frustrating things that I share with the American people is that even after the House passes legislation by wide margins, it doesn't go into effect. And I wanted to make sure that we didn't uh, embarrass ourselves by having an effective date for this legislation after the cutoff mail date. I might also indicate that the gentleman's hypothetical included at least three ifs. Uh, regardless of how many ifs, ands, and buts are placed on any hypothetical, it is fundamentally wrong, in my opinion, to allow taxpayers' dollars to be spent by members to co communicate with people who that member has never represented and those people have never voted for. That is something to be done after you represent them, not before, if you use taxpayers' dollars. It should have been done in February. Mr. Sullivan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Bill, let me commend you again for pursuing this legislation. Uh, you are the ranking member of the appropriate committee of jurisdiction, and uh, under normal circumstances, uh, under the rules of the House, if we went directly to the floor, your amendment would be allowed, you'd be able to offer it, and I'm sure it would pass overwhelmingly. And because of that, I hope this committee will make it in order uh, for you to offer it on the floor. It's been represented, and I believe it's correct, that it was inadvertently placed in the category of all of the October 1 dates, and that this is simply to bring it back to the understood agreement uh, of the subcommittee when the amendment was adopted in the Legislative Appropriation Subcommittee. And I certainly hope this committee will make it in order. Thank you for coming. Bob? Mr. Gordon? No questions. Mr. Quillen? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to congratulate you, Bill, on the good job that you do. And I think it would be tremendously wrong to allow an October the first date so members can use the prank politically, glaringly so, and we all know when we send out a, a newsletter there's some politics involved. But I don't think it should be part of the uh, November election. I think you're right. It should be on adoption, and I support your concept. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to congratulate you for uh, this very important work, Bill. You'll recall that it was your brilliant testimony before this committee that led some members of this committee to become co-sponsors of the legislation. So uh, I would like to think that your effort here, once again, will play a role in creating an even greater margin of victory on the House floor, and maybe ultimate implementation of this. There's going to be a lot of votes. A lot of votes? Well, that means at least two. Mr. Billington, any questions? As I recall, 
some of us understood even before you came, long before you came to this committee, that was a good bill and signed out as co-authors. I remember some names, and I think yours uh, stands out prominently at the present time, Mr. Billingson. Mr. McEwen. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Honorable George Geekus, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, Mr. Geekus has been uh, delayed, I think, for a medical reason, but. Uh, Jeez. <clears throat> If, uh, if I might just submit uh, for the record objection. a copy of a letter that he had written to you and I. Thank Without you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Clyde Holloway. Can we, can we go vote? We're gonna Thank you, Mr. We're Chairman. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Members of the uh, committee, uh, I'll be very brief because I know you hear what I tell you a million times through the years, but. Uh, the purpose of the amendment that I'm offering, of course, is to pro provide a 5% uh, cut in funding for the standing uh, committees as well as the select committees. Uh, I have to open by telling you that I actually have a bill before Congress that would totally abolish the select committees. Uh, I feel that the argument we've heard today about the last decade being very little growth, I, I do not feel that pertains to committees. And, uh, in the House because I think there's been tremendous growth amongst committees. Uh, I really have to compliment uh, what has happened this year because I think we have finally started to see the light and I don't know what caused it in the fact that we do have to hold down uh, growth amongst the standing committees of this uh, of the House as well as the select committees and uh, I think the American people demand it. Uh, I'm a business person and I make some cuts that I don't want to make sometime. They're very painful and I think the business community of this country is having to make cuts today that are very painful to them. Uh, we don't seem to see it that way in the House and uh, I heard the argument earlier that we, we sometimes vote and hope that our vote doesn't pass. I disagree with that. I, I feel we can do it. I feel even if we had to do it with our own staffs we can still do it. But I really believe that uh, we have grown at a rate uh, that I've heard over and over 1800 percent over the last uh, 40 years amongst uh, committees in this House, and I believe that there is plenty of room for a 5% cut or, as Mr. Smith will offer, a 10% cut, which I will vote for also. Uh, but mine simply is a 5% cut in the committee uh, voting, and actually the, the committee on the House administration voted uh, originally for the amount of funding of uh, 55 million uh, thirty one thousand dollars uh, my bill bringing down the actual amount the appropriations committee allowed of fifty seven million nine hundred thousand uh, dollars my five percent cut brings it to fifty five million uh, five thousand which is pretty much in straight line with what the uh, committee on house administrations offered uh, i was alarmed and really my attention was brought by the, the Select Committee on Children, Youth, and Family, Mrs. Uh, Schroeder, asking for a 47% increase in our budget. Uh, committees that are totally duplicating, uh, and not to say there's not good things to come out of those committees, and that hearings are very helpful at times, and I'm very involved in that committee, but uh, I led the battle in committee, and I just feel that we have to answer uh, to the call that was made last week when we talked about a balanced budget and said it's up to us to do it and we can do it, uh, we can make those tough decisions and tough cuts. This is a very small part of it, but I feel something that should be done and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to testify before you and I know we have a vote and uh, I'll Thank try to cut my testimony at that Any point. Any questions, Mr. Billings? No, sir. Only, only to point out that, that the gentleman was kind enough to himself point out that, that the committee has come to us with a bill this year which has cut a substantial amount, which is, is a good thing. <laughs> Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, just briefly, uh, let me commend the gentleman. I've already spoken uh, earlier on behalf of your amendment as one that would be allowed under normal process. You shouldn't, certainly should be allowed to offer it. Select committees um, uh, such as the Narcotics and Abuse were formed back in the uh, mid-70s, late-70s. They are all formed for one specific issue for a limited time, and most of them have been in uh, existence for 10, 15 years. Uh, that's wrong. If, they, uh, if there's need for them to stay in existence, then we ought to create permanent standing committees, uh, and never mind this select committee, which just goes on and on and on and on. I support your amendment. Thank you. And I, I just say that that was brought before when we even committed, uh, created these committees. Uh, That's the exact statement you made was we were creating a monster that would go on forever. So I appreciate that very much. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say, Clyde, that this is a very important 
work. Motherhood and apple pie when we oppose some of these select committees because they have such wonderful names and yet so much of what they do should fall under the jurisdiction of standard you know, committees which are there and have jurisdiction over these areas. And uh, some of the things that we were talking about in the staffing area a few minutes ago I think apply here. We could, we could uh, really move ahead dramatically if we were to make the kinds of changes which you're trying to do. And I compliment you on your efforts, Clyde. If I could just say, I think the danger we see, we're going even into investigative staff in these select committees. I mean, we're, we're totally duplicating and now we're even going the route of, of hiring investigative staff on these committees. So I think we're really treading still on down that same road and becoming more dangerous and wanting to be bigger and bigger and more jurisdiction as we go on. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for your statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. I think the chair will be in recess until uh, we get through with the other roll calls. It's the intention of the chair to continue on this uh, appropriations bill until the hour of 5.45. At that time, we'll, we'll put this aside until tomorrow and go with military construction. Mr. Smith. Mr. Mr. Chairman, oh, may I ask a question? Uh, for those members that uh, we may not get to, or if they're not here, can they? Uh, would they have the right to be heard tomorrow? I'm sorry. I, I'd ask if we have members uh, that um, might not be able to testify by 4, 5:45, and those that uh, may not be here because of the we are going to rise on it, if they could be heard tomorrow in a timely manner. Yes, I can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and committee members, the amendment I propose to offer would reduce funding for certain legislative branch overhead costs such as travel, supplies, and materials by 10%. These are common sense cuts. The Legislative Appropriations Subcommittee already has cut members' official expenses and franking accounts by 19%, so my amendment would exempt these accounts. Also, it would be my intent to exempt the mileage of members' accounts because funding in these accounts is set by law. And the recent freeze on committee accounts effectively reduces funding for committee overhead costs by approximately 10%. So committee overhead funds in the standing special and select committees also are exempted. My amendment primarily would impact joint and other legislative branch agencies. It would require them to do what the Legislative Appropriations Subcommittee has asked the House to do, reduce overhead spending. The amendment is part of my efforts over more than two years to identify and provide our colleagues in the House practical, realistic opportunities to reduce the government's overhead costs. My resolution calling for a 10 percent reduction in overhead spending has attracted 68 co-sponsors from both sides of the aisle. The desire to cut waste crosses all party lines, all economic lines, all regional lines. We can save millions of dollars by cutting overhead without touching one federal program or a single federal job. My intent is to offer similar amendments to each appropriations bill that includes funding for agency expenses. Let me make clear why I am seeking to first offer this amendment on the legislative appropriation bill. I believe it is in the interest of our colleagues 
in the House to take a specific legislative branch-wide action to control our overhead spending before asking the executive branch to do the same. The House should have the opportunity to demonstrate that it has the will to act to reduce its cost and set an example for the others. <laughs> Having done this, members will be able to act to do the same to control executive branch costs. They will be able to resist the pressures of special interests who would argue, yes, but not my program's overhead. To create a basis upon which members can act to better control overhead spending government-wide, I hope you will allow me to offer my amendment. And let me add a couple of other points, and that is that government overhead spending, which includes travel and supplies and materials, is very seldom specifically scrutinized by the federal government. In fact, we haven't uh, seen any indications that it has been scrutinized by the federal government. Uh, in addition to that, government overhead spending has been increasing at more than the inflation rate every year for 20 years. So it's high time that we did uh, target it as far as our cost as far as our cuts go. The other thing, as far as any cuts do go, I think this is probably the least painful way to go because it allows us to cut uh, such spending that does not include the programs, it does not include people. So we're not talking about cutting any essential program. Uh, Mr. Chairman, also just in the last couple of days, uh, this amendment has been endorsed by the National Taxpayers Union and also by the Citizens Against Government Waste. Uh, so it, uh, we have momentum for the amendment and we hope that you'll see fit to make it in order. We're going to interrupt just a momentarily to bring up the military construction appropriation for fiscal year 1993, H.R. 5428. The chair will be in receipt of a, a motion. From me, Mr. Chairman? From you. Here it is. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 5428, a rule waiving clause two, 2 of rule 21 against all provisions of the bill. You've heard the motion, gentlemen, from California. Any discussion? Mr. Solomon? Mr. Chairman, uh, this rule is before us uh, because it contains uh, legislation in the appropriation bill, and that's why the Rules Committee has, uh, has jurisdiction today. Gentlemen, correct. And that's the only uh, the only other reason we wouldn't have any objection to it going to the floor. And also, the authorization bill hasn't been signed into law. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Question comes on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The, the motion's adopted. The rule will be carried by Mr. Hall and... And Mr. Chairman, uh, the uh, gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Quillen, will carry Mr. for the minority. Mr. Quillen will carry for the minority. We're now we're back on 5427. Lamar, I'm... Thanks, Mr. Chairman. May I have just yes. I'm looking for an amendment which would... which would cut the uh, money for travel back across the country because I'm getting tired of flying back and forth every weekend. <laughs> Would yours be of any help with that? I, that I hate respect? to tell you, uh, my amendment would exempt members because their accounts have already been cut 19%. I don't oh. think there's any uh, reason to cut them anymore. So my amendment... I think the only defense is to tell people we're not allowed to come home every <laughs> weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, it wouldn't help you out. I'm talking about cutting... Uh, members' accounts have already been cut. We're talking about the joint committees and, and uh, other parts of the legislative appropriations bill, not members um, okay, sure. because of the cuts already. Thank you. Wish Thank I could you, be Mr. a chairman. Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Mr. Smith, uh, I've discussed your amendment with you several uh, times over the last several days, and uh, uh, I strongly support your amendment. It makes a lot of sense. It is one of those that would be allowed under normal rules of the House if we had gone straight to the floor with the appropriation bill. Uh, let me just understand, uh, it does uh, reduce the uh, travel uh, expenses for members also back in their districts? Does not, Jerry. Does not touch members' travel expenses. That has already been cut by the Appropriations Committee at okay. some 19%. This is average. travel... Uh, so this, we're talking about not members' uh, expenses. We're talking about other than members. It could be Joint Committee. It could be the other legislative uh, uh, uh -huh. bills provisions. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very good amendment, and it, it certainly sets the right tone. I hope we can make it in order for you. The idea, just to expand on that, the idea of the amendment is to cut, as I say, overhead spending. A lot of people confuse overhead spending. Overhead spending does not include salaries. It does not include programs. We're talking about, you know, travel, uh, supplies, uh, rent, um, materials such as that. And this is an, uh, a, an item in the budget that has never before been really scrutinized, and it's high time that we did target it. And that's a way to cut, and it's, in my judgment, the least painful way to cut. I thank the gentleman for coming. Mr. Frost. Uh, 
Mr. Smith, uh, I assume from uh, reading your amendment, I assume from reading your amendment that this would apply to the Library of Congress. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, the librarian of the Library of Congress has expressed some very strong concern about the library's ability to continue providing the kind of service that it does to the members of Congress if it were to undergo any other cut other than the cut that has already been written into the bill by the committee. And I don't know if other members uh, on the Rules Committee uh, have heard from the librarian on this, but uh, he is very concerned about the ability of the Library of Congress and the Congressional Research Service to meet the, uh, the needs of, uh, of Congress as an institution. And this is, of course, irrespective of party. Uh, this is simply uh, fulfilling the many uh, requests for information that members of both parties make to the Library of Congress. Martin, let me respond, if I may, to that. Uh, I'm sure that there are some uh, priorities that might need to be set, but generally if we start making exemptions in one part of the legislative branch, uh, we're going to have to start making other exemptions, and you know that road, once you make one, you, you start down a long road. Uh, it's my feeling that uh, we can't make any exemptions. We have to set the example uh, if we're going to be able to, if we want to go on and cut other, uh, say, the executive branch as well. Uh, the other answer is that the 10% that I'm, uh, cut that I'm talking about is a 10% cut in the 93 request, which is basically uh, brings it back down to the 92 levels. And I think that uh, what the Library of Congress is being asked to absorb, uh, we're being asked to absorb, uh, and everybody will be asked to absorb, so it'll be across the board. The other idea, as far as these various five categories of overhead spending goes, what I'm saying is that the overall amount would be cut 10%. So the Library of Congress does not have to necessarily cut 10% of travel, he just has to cut 10% of the overall budget. He might choose to cut uh, more than 10% in another area if he wants to keep the travel up or if he wants to keep up the uh, printing, he might cut travel. So it's not, it's not uh, micromanaging. It's just saying that in, in the general category of overhead spending, there has to be a 10% uh, cut if, from the 93 request. If I understand your amendment, uh, it applies to travel. The description before me says it applies to travel, supplies, and materials. Right. That's a cumulative total. We're cutting the cumulative uh, total 10%, not each category 10%. Yeah. The, uh, the librarian also has... Uh, has provided to me, and I assume to other members of the committee, um, some, a summary of the activities engaged in by the library, mm -hmm. and that in addition to providing services for the Congress, uh, it also does a considerable amount for the, uh, for the general public. Mm -hmm. And that, um, according to the librarian, the uh, almost 70% of their work is not directly related to the Congress, but is related to uh, 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 the public and to uh, to the general multitude of uh, jobs that they do, and uh, they are involved in quite a few things, as I think you know. And uh, um, he ha he has uh, the, the, some very legitimate concerns, and um, uh, this is a tremendous amount of uh, of cataloging of materials of. Uh, serving blind and physically handicapped readers all over the United States uh, with talking books, um, um, registering over 600,000 items annually uh, uh, through the Copyright Office. I have some concern about, uh, and, and I serve on the, the subcommittee of the uh, House Administration Committee, which has oversight over the uh, Library of Congress, uh, Mr. Clay's committee. And, and I think the, the librarian has raised some very legitimate concerns. It's unfortunate, quite frankly, that, that his uh, particular agency is funded as a part of the legislative branch bill because it does so many things beyond just serving the Congress of the United States. And I, 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 I'm afraid that it's going to get caught up uh, in the effort to uh, cut funding for our own branch uh, when it really should be, uh, be outside of that uh, because of many of the things that it does uh, serve the nation as a whole. Martin, the concerns that you just expressed and, and the talking books program and things like that, I want to emphasize that is not overhead. That would not be cut. When you talk about programs, when you talk about, say, the salaries of individuals that are part of these outreach programs, uh, that is not overhead as I've defined it. Uh, so I don't know that it will well, necessarily it, adverse impact those. I think it would affect, if, if you're talking about materials and mm -hmm. supplies, it seems to me that it inevitably would uh, impact those kind of programs. It'll impact them not as directly as you might say. We're not talking about a cuts in the people again or the programs themselves, but you are talking about the supplies and perhaps the printing and things like that. There might be ways around that. Let me suggest that, that all of us could, uh, for instance, uh, undertake. We can print on both sides of a piece of paper and easily save 10% in printing. Most, most of the and things that I get from the Library of Congress, I think, already are printed on both sides. But I, I just, 
I express my very strong concern. Uh, I think Dr. Billington and his staff at the Library of Congress do an extraordinary job um, serving the Congress and, and serving the entire country, and uh, I think it would be regrettable if, if they had to take an even deeper cut than they're already going yeah. to take under the bill as drafted by the committee. Right. I think, uh, again, I think that there's probably no place that we can't cut some overhead spending even at the Library of Congress. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it should be made crystal clear in the colloquy on the floor, should this amendment be made in order, that the House has already cut 19 percent. Because if it comes out, we're cutting everybody else except the House, no. we're going to have a black eye. I agree. The House, you know, the members themselves have been cut about 19 percent. I'm talking about other than members cutting 10 percent. I know you are, so. but the perception that the people will have is that we have exempted ourselves. Right. We don't want to do that. Make, make it clear that we've already cut ourselves. In fact, more than I'm proposing uh, for the overhead cuts. Thank right. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Hall. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say that uh, I think what you're doing here is very important. I, too, am one who has a great deal of respect, as I know you do, for Dr. Billington and the work of the Library of Congress. But at the same time, it is essential that we pursue uh, some kind of reduction here. And I think that's exactly what you're trying to get at Lamar. And I'll just tell you that I'll wholeheartedly support your effort. Thank you, David. <coughs> Thank you very much. The Honorable Fred Upton. Fred? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will uh, ask that my statement be considered as read. And, Without objection? Uh, I, I would just like to say this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a vote on the balanced budget amendment. Uh, I think virtually all members in the House chamber talked about making tough choices. And the amendment that I stand here today promoting, uh, led by Mr. Roberts, who was un unable to be here today, as well as myself, uh, really is a tough choice, and that is to cut our franking budgets uh, by about $10 million. Uh, briefly, this proposed Roberts Upton amendment cuts the fiscal 1993 franking funds from $53 million, as in the committee report, to $41 million. In fiscal year 1991, the last non-election year, the House offices spent $31 million on mail. So this $41 million figure that we are proposing for fiscal year 93 allows for about a $10 million increase in postage costs from two years ago. It's about a 30% increase, uh, but still $12 million less than the committee recommended. And I would urge, uh, as we were able to offer an amendment last year to the legislative appropriation bill, that we'd be allowed to do so again this year. Any questions? Solomon. <clears throat> the uh, Roberts uh, Upton Amendment is allowed under normal procedure. If you went to the floor, you'd have the opportunity to offer it. We, uh, we hope we can give you that same right under this restrictive rule. Which and, we oppose. And, uh, and again, we had that same right last year when this came up. Thank you. Uh, well, no question, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to reiterate that a point, and I hope that when this committee begins consideration of these amendments, I was talking to my friend from California, Mr. Cox, on the floor just a few minutes ago. I hope that every member who was able to offer an amendment last year to this bill on the floor has that same right under this rule that we consider. So I want to ensure that you do it. Thank you. Mr. McEwen. No, no question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank you very much. <coughs> the Honorable Christopher Cox. Thank you, Hi. Mr. Chairman. I will be brief in as much as the amendment that I am offering is one referred to by my colleague, Mr. Dreyer, that was offered last year. It is an amendment to that I offer as a four-year member of the Government Operations Committee and as the Republican co-chair of the Congressional Grace Caucus to fund the General Accounting Office at one-third of a billion dollars for the next fiscal year. This would be a 50% increase from the GAO's 1980 budget of $204 million. It is widely understood that in order to get at the cost of government generally, we've got to go after some of the very large substantial programs. The entitlement programs, for example, have drawn a great deal of attention. 
when it comes to legislative appropriations, uh, the fact is that the largest single aspect of it is the GAO. And because GAO has been growing so quickly, it uh, especially deserves our attention. Its budget has increased dramatically in the last few years, 14.3% from FY90 to 1991, and another 8.1% from 91 to 92. There are over now over 5,000 employees uh, at the GAO. That is one quarter of the entire legislative budget and one third of all legislative staff. The GAO now has 16 regional offices as well as offices overseas and across the country. Uh, there are at any given point in time between 100 and 200 GAO employees detailed to congressional committees at a cost of about four million dollars each year. Twenty years ago, eighty percent of all of GAO's audits and reports were performed independent of congressional request. Now, eighty percent of GAO's audits and reports are performed upon congressional committee chair request. In other words, this part of our congressional staff, which is really what it is, has grown disproportionately to the rest of what is happening in the legislative branch and increasingly it has become simply an adjunct of all of the other work that we do here. So it is my purpose to make sure that we preserve the essential mission of GAO but that we run it cost efficiently. I believe that the fine work that we expect from this agency can be accomplished uh, quite handily for one third of a billion dollars each year and that is the amendment that I propose. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Solomon. <clears throat> Chris, what was the, uh, was a recorded vote on your amendment last year? Uh, there was, and I'm sorry I don't have those numbers, but I got significant support, I'd say about, uh, just off the top of my head, uh, 160, 170 votes. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, your amendment is germane. It doesn't require any waivers. Uh, you're entitled to offer it, and uh, we hope we can make it in order for you. I appreciate Thanks. that. Mr. Quillen? No Mr. Ryer? Mr. Chairman, I just want to uh, again say that um, you have done this before, and I hope very much that we don't, in this committee, block you from having the chance to do it again. I thank my colleague. McEwen. Mr. Chairman, uh, Chris, do you have a list of the committees that have these detailees from GAO? I can certainly endeavor to obtain that for you. I did not bring it with me to this hearing. I understand that they're not universally distributed. Some, some committees rely on them rather heavily, do they not? Yeah. I would not be surprised were that the case. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Cliff Stearns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. I come before the committee uh, in reference to two amendments. Uh, one of them I'd like to withdraw which is the cut of 15% of all the select committees. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, that leaves the second amendment, which is, uh, I'd like to have an order to the amendment to H.R. 5427, the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill. Uh, this amendment uh, makes a 2% cut across the board. And, of course, all of us are aware of the federal deficit. I don't have to go into the details with this, uh, with you folks. Uh, two weeks ago, the vast majority of members of the House voted in favor of a balanced budget amendment. While the amendment did not receive the two-thirds majority necessary, Congress did reach a consensus. Since then, we have made cuts in the armed services authorization and killed the superconducting super collider. There are good arguments for and against these cuts, but in the end, fiscal conservatism won out. And I think that's the argument here today for my amendment, Mr. Chairman. We have an opportunity to show that we in the House are ready to share in the hardship that so many Americans have experienced over the last two years. Uh, passing this 2% cut may mean that we may have to do our job with a little bit less and make our money stretch a little further, so be it. However, that is exactly what most Americans are having to do today. Our economy is starting to show signs of recovery and I believe it's appropriate to send the right signal here in Washington. Uh, a 2% cut will not bring legislative operations to a halt. It will merely require us to send, spend our money more wisely. It is a reduction we can live with, and I hope uh, you will recommend this amendment uh, for consideration for the full House. Any questions? 
Mr. Hall. Chairman, um, uh, did you say you withdrew the balance selection bills? Yes, sir. Yeah, I did. What remains then? Just this one amendment for 2% across the board on legislative. Solid. Cliff, your amendment is germane, and again, it requires no waivers. You should be entitled to offer it, and we hope you have that opportunity. Thank you, Jerry. Mr. Quillen. Chairman, no questions, but I think it's a good amendment, and I hope you do offer it. Thank you. Mr. Dreyer. Would you I'll like go to one step or something? Excuse me? Would you like to reinforce the statement of Mr. Well, Solomon? No, I think what I'd like to... I'm, I'm going to go one step further, Mr. Chairman, and I'll say that I'm not only going to fight for your right to offer the amendment, but I'll tell you, if it gets to the floor, I'll vote for the amendment. Hey. Thanks. Hello. Mr. McEwen. I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable James Walsh. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. <coughs> uh, I have a statement that I'd like to have uh, entered in, into the record, and I'll try to speak for Without objection, the entire statement of the gentleman from New York will be entered into the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, by way of introduction, I, I just want you to know I'm not, a, I'm not freelancing on this uh, issue. This is something that comes under the jurisdiction of the Committee on House Administration. And uh, Congressman Gadenson and I were given responsibility for this issue by Chairman Rose. Uh, I've come before you today to ask that you permit uh, my colleague and friend Pat Roberts and myself to introduce an amendment uh, simply stated that would eliminate all public financing uh, through House member clerk hire accounts and uh, or special expense accounts, official expense accounts for legislative service organizations, LSOs. Uh, this issue has come up before Congressman Frenzel in the past has discussed it. Uh, Congressman uh, Roberts has discussed it. Uh, when my father was elected to Congress over 20 years ago, there were only four legislative service organizations. Uh, they are not essential. The great civil rights legislation passed during the 1960s was passed without the aid of any legislative service organizations. Um, we now have uh, 30. LSOs, and I belong to some of them, uh, but they are non-essential. With a budget deficit of $400 billion, I think it's time that, and, and it's pretty obvious that, that you are indeed looking at how we spend our money and how much we spend, and I think that's good. Uh, we have to follow, as the members of, of this body, have to follow strict guidelines on spending the public's money. Uh, LSOs do not. They file a quarterly statement that's uh, uh, that's filed every three months after the money's been spent. Uh, we can't do that. Uh, it allows for the hiring of consultants, the purchase of gifts. Um, spouses can be members uh, or can be uh, uh, on the caucus payroll of these uh, LSOs. Uh, large expenditures are made uh, and uh, trips for members and spouses are paid for by these caucuses and affiliated uh, foundations and institutions. Um, there have been four task forces in the past 10 years regarding uh, LSOs, trying to uh, uh, make them more accountable. Not one recommendation of any of those four task forces, and they've made many recommendations, not one has ever been followed. Uh, I'm not implying that LSOs are bad. In fact, I think they're good. Uh, however, I just don't think that given the structure of this body, uh, we can afford them. And uh, we have a committee system, as we all know, that served this nation well for 200 years. Uh, we all know we have too many committees and subcommittees. We can't make all the meetings that we have now. There is no need to take these issues, <clears throat> the, these, uh, these, uh, um, an, another venue or another layer of decision making uh, and put it in the hands of uh, legislative service organizations when committees are fully equipped to handle all these issues. Um, and one last note, the United States uh, Senate, the other body, does not uh, allow official, uh, or does not provide official recognition of LSOs and does not allow public funds to be used for them. And I think we should and can do no less than what they do. What LSOs do you belong to? Uh, tourism, Steel, New York State Delegation, to name a few. And they're good. I, I, you know, there's nothing intrinsically evil about them, and I, I think they do some good, but, but can we afford them? Can we afford 
uh, given the fact that we're going to be cutting our staff funding by five or six percent uh, in the next several days, can we afford to uh, pay for basically what is another layer of committee structure? Leave the question to you, and, and I ask for the opportunity to offer this amendment on the floor. Okay. <coughs> Any questions, panelists? Mr. Frost. Well, Mr. Walsh, I, I just want to understand what you're saying. Um, we each receive a certain amount of money right. to run our offices, and we are permitted to use that money for a number of designated purposes, right. travel, uh, printing, telephones, d district office rent, variety of things. Uh, one of the things that we can use that money for is dues to legislative service organizations. Um, this is not an add-on, this is not an additional set of money, an additional amount of money. This is simply letting us use it, money that we already have, whatever that figure is, whether that figure is X or whether that figure is X minus 10 percent, whatever the figure is. Let us use some of that money to belong to a legislative service organization. So if you eliminate legislative service organizations, you're not reducing the amount of money that we can spend as a member of Congress, you're just eliminating one of the purposes that we can spend that money for. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman is correct <clears throat> in his statement that uh, this would, uh, that we are, we are not allocated additional monies for this purpose. It's just it's discretionary uh, as our other expenditures are. What I'm saying is this is, a, a, uh, this is a, another level of the committee process. It takes it takes it, it takes taxpayer money. If you're assuming that we're most of us are going to belong, belong to these things, and we most of us do, it's going to require money and time and effort and staff. And quite well, frankly, we're we're running out of most of those items. Well, I understand that, but it doesn't require any additional money. It's money that we already have, and uh, just whatever our budget is, it's one of the purposes. For example. Uh, I belong to the uh, Democratic Study Group, uh, which provides a, uh, uh, a summary of what's coming up on the floor each single day, a weekly summary, provides uh, background uh, issue papers on legislation that I'm going to have to vote on as a member of Congress. Uh, I personally find uh, those materials to be very useful. I assume that you must have something comparable on the Republican side. No, we um, read yours. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, it makes it, uh, uh, and these these particular publications of the uh, DSG are generally uh, viewed by all Democratic members, whether they be conservative, moderate, or liberal, as being very objective uh, in summarizing legislation. Uh, there's no difference within our, uh, within our caucus on whether these are useful materials or not. And uh, it just seems to me that uh, you're trying to, uh, in your effort to eliminate all these organizations, uh, you are reaching organizations that are very valuable to us in terms of the performance of our job and you're not saving the institution or saving the country any money in the process. I don't understand what your motivation is and I don't, I'm not asking that in a, in a harsh way. I, I don't understand what you're really up to here. Well, uh, it's quite simple. I'm trying to scale down the size of this government that, is, that, that uh, you, has, been, has been in front of you all day today, the legislative uh, appropriations bill. Everyone's asking you to cut it. But what we're I'm not cutting. Is, well, Your amendment would, would, would not cut money finish. spent. What we're trying to do is, is you can, that information that you referred to is available, either from, from the Heritage Foundation or the Brookings Institution. There are more information database organizations, operations in this town and within telephone reach than uh, we need, pr probably. And we d I don't think we need to create taxpayer-supported <coughs> organizations that fund pure special, special interest caucuses. Would the gentleman yield? Well, no, no, I'll yield in a moment, but I just want to finish the line of thought because I, I'm trying to understand what the gentleman is, the point the gentleman is trying to make. And if I understand correctly, he's not talking about eliminating money, he's talking about eliminating people, eliminating people who perform a particular function, but not to save the government any money. What I'm talking mm -hmm. about is eliminating the use of taxpayer money to fund LSOs. I understand. But, but it doesn't save the government any money by doing that. 
Well, if we would eliminate those, then maybe we could get at some other savings that need to be to be made here too. But, but you're not asking that the amount of money available to us uh, for our what's called uh, no, our official not. office expense be be, no, uh, be reduced in, even a penny in you're, your amendment. You're correct. I just don't think the taxpayer dollars should be used to fund special interest caucuses. Okay, I, I have no other questions, and I'd be glad to. The gentleman will be called upon, I think, by the chairman. I've used all my time, but I'd be glad to yield if I have any time left. Okay. So, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Jim, I support your uh, your amendments, but let me just point one thing out to you that uh, under normal procedure, uh, your amendment would not be allowed, uh, or a point of order could be raised against it on the floor. Uh, there is a, if this uh, bill had gone straight to the floor, there is a procedure uh, by which after all amendments have been offered and were successful or unsuccessful, uh, there is a motion to, uh, for the committee to rise and go back into the so-called House. And um, under our rules, uh, if that were to happen, uh, if that motion were to be defeated, then anyone such as yourself with uh, limiting amendments uh, such as yours, mm -hmm. uh, you would then have the opportunity to offer it. You are not uh, uh, going to have that opportunity now because you would be prohibited if this rule doesn't specifically allow you to do that. So because of that... I, I, I don't mean to correct the gentleman, but I, I don't believe that's the case. I believe that the motion to rise procedure is always available. And uh, the gentleman would, unless we reported a totally closed rule, that the gentleman, uh, unless we concluded language and it attempted to include language which would somehow override the motion to rise, and I don't think there's any, any suggestion on our side that that's going to happen, uh, well, that the gentleman will simply have to defeat the motion yeah. to rise. Well, that's what I'm pointing out to the gentleman. I'm going to give him a copy of the rule. Uh, let me just read it for you. It says, motions that the committee of the whole rise and report the bill to the House with such amendments as may have been adopted shall have precedence, and this is what the gentleman from Texas is talking about, shall have precedence over motions to further amend the bill. And then if any such motion is rejected, amendments proposing limitations not specifically contained, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which means that you then would have that right. I just hope we don't preclude him is what I'm saying. Uh, the rule could preclude you from offering those amendments. We're going to try to keep that open so you would have that opportunity. Do, do you mean preclude by not... Uh, by not motion having rise? prohibiting language in this rule that would prohibit him from uh, trying to defeat the motion and make that amendment... Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't... If we, the gentleman... That hasn't been discussed. Yeah, if the gentleman yield, I, I have particular in interest in this because I'm the author of that particular rule that appears in... that just, you just quoted right. from, and I don't believe that since that rule was passed by the House of Representatives that we have ever tried to take away uh, the motion to rise okay. procedure, uh, that well, we've ever tried to prevent so, uh, someone from defeating the motion to rise. Marty, the reason I make the, uh, I, I bring this up is that this is the first time that we've ever had this legislative appropriation bill come to the Rules Committee. And we are seeing a lot of things happen for the first time, and I'm calling attention so that we hope it doesn't. I haven't seen the rule yet and uh, right. won't see it until tomorrow. But, so uh, I hope the gentleman... Did, uh, the gentleman didn't mean to suggest that we, that, that, that we were going to necessarily going to do that. You were no, concerned and, that and, it and might and be and done, and not, and that we, not that it's going right. to be done. And, and I hope that the gentleman, since he was the author of this rule, uh, would support any effort to, uh, to keep that from happening. I, I'm not aware that, uh, that this committee has ever tried to, uh, uh, to make it impossible for someone under any, any appropriations bill. You have uh, Marty Frost in my support in this, well, I can see now. The answer is that this rule would not preclude me from, from challenging the motion to rise and, and right. uh, exercising my right to do that. The gentleman from Texas is saying that he doesn't think that's going to happen, and we certainly got I can't to imagine it. that it would happen, and it hasn't happened under any appropriations bill that we've, uh, we've considered. Oh, I appreciate the gentleman's input. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Quillen. No thanks. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I was just going to say earlier, Jim, that what you have done is you have very effectively pointed out that there are areas in which we can make cuts. Now, Martin makes a very good point that you're not specifically saying that you and your proposed amendment are actually making a reduction. But we have a wide range of other amendments that have been proposed by our colleagues in which they are making the statement, we want a 10% cut, a 2% cut, all kinds of levels. And it seems to me that, as you've just said, that organizations that are out there in the private sector are duplicating 
much of what is done here, or I should say we are duplicating much of what is being done by private organizations, the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, Brookings, a wide range of other, uh, I'm, I'm thinking uh, about the, uh, the committee that is being set up here, which this wouldn't be actually an LSO, but we had uh, Norman Ornstein, Ornstein and, and Thomas Mann, who are going to be recommend, making recommendations to the Hamilton Gratison Committee on ways in which we can reform this institution. Those are going to be private sector, uh, you know, f organizations making proposals to this uh, Congress. And while we're all saying that there, there is room to be cut, what you've done with this amendment is you've said there are 30 organizations known as legislative service organizations which could have reductions. And we, if, we, if we prevent members from expending dollars on those uh, LSOs, then we're saying, hey, we've got a very good reason to cut the amounts that are appropriated for members' offices. So I think that you've, you've made a very good point here. And uh, while I think, as Mr. Solomon has said, this is legislating in an appropriations bill, which we really uh, cannot enthusiastically support, I think that your point is one that's well taken. <laughs> I appreciate the gentleman's comments. I couldn't have said them better myself. And the, the fact is that the information that these LSOs were, were developed to, to provide is available a thousandfold uh, and at no cost. There are, there are uh, organizations all over this, uh, this part of the country and uh, the rest of it that provide this information to us at no cost. Thank you very much, Mr. Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Honorable Wayne Allen of Jim. Colorado. Uh, the Honorable John Bone of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right, Mr. Mokley. I saw the You e and most of my constituents are. I saw the E after the O, and I remember a spelling lesson not too long ago, so I just figured it was It's Bo. German. It's German. <laughs> German. Yeah. Germany, there would be an umlaut over there. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, I have two amendments on my own that uh, I'd like to, to uh, ask uh, the committee's favor on today. And because Mr. Roberts is stuck in Kansas, I have two amendments of his that uh, uh, I'd like to speak on. First uh, amendment uh, deals with uh, the uh, Joint Committee on Printing. Uh, the Joint Committee on Printing has oversight responsibility on the General Printing uh, Office. And uh, in 1983, the committee had 17 employees. Today, they have 17 employees. Uh, but their budget has increased uh, uh, substantially to the point of uh, $1.391 million. And what this amendment does simply is ask that we cut the amount of money that goes to the uh, Joint Committee on Printing by 30%. Uh, to put it back uh, in a level where it was two or three years ago. Considering the fact they have no more employees than they had nine years ago. What is, what is the reason for the costs? Oh, uh, that's... can't be salaries, just salaries. It is only salaries. All right. And, and travel expenses, uh, other types of overhead expenses. And the fact is they have no more employees than they did ten years ago. And so the question that I ask myself and, and others among us have asked is, why do they need all of this money? And so we offer this amendment. Hope you'll make it an order. Okay. Do you have another amendment? Uh, the other amendment, Mr. Chairman, is an amendment that I offered uh, last year uh, that I've offered to the committee. Here is a substitute amendment. Basically moves the, uh, get? Moves the amendment uh, to a different place in the committee. But it says uh, simply that none of the funds made available by this act may be used for acquisition of voter registration lists for the House of Representatives. Uh, currently, members of the House can purchase voter registration lists uh, for use in their congressional office uh, from their official expense account. Now, whether they buy it through the House Administration uh, Committee, uh, this is the information that's currently available on CD-ROM or other areas, uh, I think that uh, uh, it's inappropriate. According to House rules, uh, this allowance may not be used to defray any personal, political, or campaign-related expenses. And besides for political or campaign purposes, what reason uh, would a member of Congress have to mail only to registered voters in his district? I don't think any. B 
Beyond the ethical questions that are raised about sending only to voters in your district, the second point that I would make is that is it appropriate to use taxpayer uh, monies, which is our official expense monies, for the use of sending mail only to vo registered voters in our districts? Uh, again, beyond the ethical question, a question I think it's inappropriate. Uh, I've offered to commit the, am the amendment last year uh, in the floor. This is a slightly different version. It's a little bit broader net. It isn't zeroed in strictly on CD-ROM. But I think the practice of members of Congress buying voter lists, bringing those into their offices, and loading them into their computer system uh, is, is out of control. It's inappropriate. And I'll be stopped. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Banner? Bill, the, uh, the two amendments uh, that you're offering uh, in place of Mr. Roberts are, again, germane amendments that are allowed under normal procedure. And uh, we hope you will have the opportunity to offer them. Uh, one of yours, uh, the uh, straight cutting amendment, is also uh, germane and, and appropriate to be, uh, to be offered. Uh, your third one, uh, prohibiting funds uh, being used to purchase voter registration lists, are you offering that one? Yes. All right. Now that that again is a limitation, and it would come under the same category as uh, as Mr. Walsh's, and uh, <clears throat> I think Mr. Camp behind you or, or, uh, might also have one in that category as well. So just so you understand, in case the committee does not make those amendments specifically in order, uh, then you would be subject to that same rule I discussed before. Okay. As far as the two amendments for Mr. Roberts. Uh, the first uh, deals with the mileage for members account that was created in the 1800s. And this is the mileage that pays our way out here at the beginning of each session and pays our way back home at, two years later at the end of the session. You know, most of our travel today back and forth from the district uh, is done out of our official expense account. Well, this account was set up in the 1800s because members didn't come here and go home every weekend or once a month. They came and they stayed until their work was finished and they went home. But this account is still uh, on the books. As you recall, you, we get a check uh, right after the first of the year, the first of a new session, uh, that pays us strictly mileage. Uh, and what uh, the amendment that offered by Mr. Roberts would do uh, would just reimburse that cost to us as we reimburse uh, ourselves or pick up the cost out of our official account uh, as we do with all the other travel that we have. Uh, the other amendment uh, goes to the issue of of an issue that started last year. As you know, there was a million dollars provided in last year's legislative appropriation bill to finish the space B6, B106 in the Cannon Building uh, for uh, who knows what. There's talk about a staff gym, there's talk about another gym. In a colloquy on the House floor, Mr. Roberts and Mr. Fazio agreed uh, that the money in last year's legislative appropriation budget uh, would not be used uh, to finish uh, a staff gym in 106 Cannon. Uh, what this uh, amendment would, would strive to do is again to make sure that no funds appropriated in this bill uh, go uh, to finish any gymnasium or any other health facility uh, here in the Capitol. There was a study done by the architect of the Capitol several years ago. It is reported. Uh, no one has ever seen it. Uh, and before it, anyone decides to proceed to finish the gym, staff gym or otherwise, uh, that at least the results of the survey be shared and be discussed uh, before we proceed with it. Those are the two amendments uh, on behalf of Mr. Roberts. Any questions? Any questions over here? Thank okay. you. Thank Chairman. you. The Honorable Dave Camp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the uh, schedule lists two amendments, and the amendment regarding reducing funding for Joint Committee on Printing by 20 percent is withdrawn. Uh, I would like to address the uh, amendment I offer, which would let members of Congress take action against the growing federal deficit. And it would do this by allowing individual members to turn back to the Treasury to reduce the deficit, unused appropriated funds from their clerk hire mail and office expense accounts. If Congress is going to ask the American people to live with the hard choices then we must, that we must make in order to balance the budget, 
then we as the representatives must be able to take the lead in that as well. Right now, members have no ability to direct unspent funds. Uh, they are allocated toward deficit reduction. Presently, funds that are not spent are shifted to other accounts to be spent for those purposes. The only choices are to either spend it all or let someone else spend it when it is reprogrammed. This amendment gives us a third choice. Mr. Chairman, last year I chose not to spend $146,000 in office budget allowances. And this amendment would uh, give the option to direct those savings to deficit reduction. I urge the committee to rule this uh, amendment in order uh, to allow debate on the merits of this amendment by all members on the floor. Thank you. So, uh, one of your amendments, well, I didn't realize it did this, that if in fact you turn money back from your clerk hire account, it that still you're not you're not reducing the deficit. What you're doing it just goes into a pot and it's used elsewhere. Is that what you're saying? Current law, uh, the amendment would give a member the option to direct that any unspent funds go to deficit reduction. Uh, currently, that's not possible. The amendment would make that possible. Currently, it's not possible. So when you turn money back today yesterday, a year ago, two years ago. What happened to the money? Uh, I understand that it goes into another account and is reprogrammed or used for other purposes. Do you know that for sure? Um, it's, that's what I've been told and that's as far as I can learn. Yes, I think that's, that's accurate. <coughs> Paul? <coughs> Chairman, I, uh, I think I can answer uh, Mr. Hall's question. Since I came here 14 years ago, I personally, and not to try to put any feathers in a cap, but uh, I've tried to return 10% uh, of, uh, of uh, my allowances back to the Treasury. And uh, uh, I've done that to the tune of about three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, and yet none of that money ever, ever went to reduce the deficit at all. It went into the, I am told, into the contingency fund. I recall one time I wrote a check back to the Treasury uh, for uh, my salary increase because Congress voted itself an increase during its term of office to take effect during its term of office. And all the time I was writing that money back to the Treasury and de depriving my wife and five children, four of whom were in college at one time, for four years running, uh, I found out that money didn't go any place but right into the contingency fund. And I was mad as hell. So I support your amendment 1,000%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dave, first of all, uh, w why did you decide to withdraw the one amendment that uh, would be made in order under the standard of, the, uh, of this procedure? Well, it was uh, placed on there by a misunderstanding, and I wasn't aware that it was mm. going to be done. Because that would have been made in order, you know, under the, because it's a cutting amendment. I, I didn't have an opportunity to review the yeah. amendment. Uh, let me say that I am also uh, very frustrated over the fact that, you know, I don't know if I've turned back three quarters of a million dollars. I'm not as magnanimous as Mr. Solomon ever in any case, but I'm sure that we've turned back some and, and uh, I can look those numbers up. But it is frustrating when we, when we hear that uh, these dollars are used when we turn them back for all kinds of things that we might not support. I mean, I've heard that they go into some sort of speaker slush fund, people have said, and all kinds of things. I've never gotten a firm answer as to exactly what happens to the dollars from our office account that we turn back. Do you have any, you said reprogrammed, I mean, do you have any well, I, as to... Uh, what, what happens at the end of the uh, fiscal year, the funds are held for all bills to be paid and then ultimately end up in a fund that uh, uh, I understand is under the uh, Legislative Branch Appropriations Subcommittee, and they approve any uh, withdrawals from those funds, uh, and uh, so that there is a, supposed to be a track record as to what happens to those funds. The purpose of this amendment, however, is to give members the ability to, to do their part in mm -hmm. deficit reduction. We're going to be asking the American people uh, to uh, live with some very tough choices. Well, it's not their part. I mean, as we all know, these are taxpayer dollars that are there. We're just saying that we want to cut right. the expenses that we have in our office in such well, a way that we their can part, actually... That's correct. Their you know, part in terms of trying to run the office more efficiently or... Right. or a little incentive to do that. An incentive to do that. Well, <clears throat> so 
the money goes back to the Legislative Appropriations Subcommittee, and they allocate it, however, and I think that committee is chaired by the majority, and they are the ones who are able to make the determination as to exactly how those dollars are expended. So, in other words, as is so often, in fact, always the case, we're in the passenger seat when it comes to trying to determine exactly how our surplus is expended. And you're trying to rectify that, and I thank you for it, even though the amendment probably won't be made in order. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And David, I c congratulate you very much. I think that what you're doing is what most members of Congress thought was done. It is that when they saved money for the taxpayers, it went back to the Treasury. And so uh, I wish you much success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Jim Ramstad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, I know the hour's late and time is short, so I will be as concise uh, as possible uh, in asking that uh, my amendment be made in order. This amendment uh, comes from uh, the Citizens for a Sound Economy, for whom I have a great deal of respect. And getting right to the point, Mr. Chairman, uh, very simply, my amendment would reduce the bill spending to the level passed for fiscal year 1991, passed by the House. That would be a 7.6% reduction amounting to a savings, uh, amounting in a savings to the taxpayer of $138 million. Now you might ask why 1991 levels? We've heard uh, members of the Appropriation Committee talk about this bill being a $19 million cut. Members of the Appropriation Committee have argue that it's uh, below the appropriations level for fiscal year 1992 by that amount, and that's true. But what they don't tell, tell us is that their 1992 baseline of $1.829 billion is a result of significant increases over the last two years by Congress. Uh, in fiscal year 91, the House passed a $1.671 billion appropriation bill for legislative matters, and then the conferees added another $70 million or a 4.2% increase over what the House had already approved. Uh, then for fiscal year 92, Congress tacked on an additional $88 million, which uh, constitutes a 5.1% increase over the previous year appropriations. And these increases uh, amounted to the $1.829 billion we're spending this year. That's, a fully, uh, that's fully $158 million more than the House originally determined it needed for fiscal year 1991. So we saw a one-year increase of $158 million. And uh, I believe, Mr. Chairman, it's time to re redeem ourselves, uh, not through uh, uh, merely vague proposals on budget reform, but through uh, making tough cuts through sound fiscal policy. And it seems to me we should start by, uh, right here at home, by uh, making some uh, reductions of this type uh, in our own uh, budget. We ask the American people to tighten their budgets and make sacrifices uh, in the national interest. It seems to me we should uh, do the same. So I think this would be a sign to the American people that Congress is actually ready to make the tough uh, decisions to uh, balance the budget. And uh, I would ask that this amendment to uh, uh, take us back to fiscal year 1991 levels uh, be made in order. Thank you very much. Any questions, the panelists? David? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, want to say that I think this is a very positive move which would uh, take us in the right direction. and. Uh, it's going to be tough for us to get this in, but uh, I, I do believe that you're moving in the right direction, and I congratulate you well, for Well, Mr. Chairman, if I may make one further comment, uh, Mr. Dreyer, at the very least, we're, everybody is giving this uh, bill uh, hype that it's a $19 million cut, but I think it's very important to uh, point out uh, uh, what happened uh, in the interim, that is, between 1991 and the present in terms of the uh, conference committee that uh, this is a significant uh, addition in funding and uh, I really believe that we need to go back to the 1991 level. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The Honorable Frank Riggs. You can't be here, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Rick Santorum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I've had the, the pleasure of sitting through and listening to all these different amendments and uh, Contrary, now, you, now you know how we feel. Yeah, <laughs> contrary to what uh, I think the perceived concern was by uh, by many people, including Mr. Fazio, uh, I don't see any amendments here that took a meat axe to this uh, to this appropriations or in any way tried to uh, shut down the institution. And 
Uh, I'm offering uh, three amendments, uh, and even contrary to what Mr. Fazio said about everyone coming out here and taking their shots, I, in fact, uh, two of the amendments I offer to spend more money. Uh, so uh, we're, we're not uh, uh, going out and trying to, to hack away. We are, in fact, trying to be constructive in uh, amending this bill and to, uh, to get a more accountable and open house. Uh, that the first two uh, uh, amendments that I'm offering are uh, to do a study of space, a space audit uh, for the House office buildings and for the Capitol buildings. Uh, we appropriate $50,000 uh, 50, uh, for that to be done. Uh, we have investigated for a long, long time to try to find out who has what space and for what purpose around here, and I've had my staff diligently working on that. And to our knowledge, we've never, there's never been a space audit done of this of the House of Representatives and either in the Capitol building or in the House office buildings and uh, that seems to be a pretty incredible thing or incredulous and I understand that this is uh, uh, legislating on an appropriation bill but as uh, the gentleman from California Mr. Lewis said earlier this is our only mechanism as a member of the House who doesn't happen to sit on the House Administration Committee uh, we don't have an authorizing bill that comes through and this is our opportunity to at least express our concern about how this institution is being run and so I will run these up the flagpole, uh, realizing the limitations by which I have to deal with in uh, making these amendments in order. Uh, this, the third amendment is one that uh, I won't give what wrote Mr. Uh, Solomon has said, uh, is would be made in order in normal circumstances. It calls for a cut of the uh, Frank Mail accounts uh, back to uh, $32,000 as Mr. Upton, who spoke earlier, uh, stated that uh, the amount used in, in 1991, the last off-year uh, uh, election, off-off-election year year in which we spent money here in, in mailing, uh, we spent about 30 million dollars. Uh, I think that uh, there should be no reason that I can understand why, with um, over 100 new members of Congress who traditionally mail a lot less than those who have been in Congress for longer periods of time, that we can't make do. Uh, with a, uh, a very small one or two percent, one percent increase uh, for for fiscal year 1993. So I've offered an amendment at 32 million dollars. I think uh, I would be frankly shocked if we even go to that level, uh, considering past mailing practices. And uh, I would hope that you could make any or all of these in order. Any questions, panelists? Any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I uh, think that you make some very good points here. I. Uh, I don't know what uh, an analysis of the space in the office building would be. I suspect that, sort of like staffing, that the majority has maybe a wee bit more than members of the minority. <laughs> maybe. And uh, it would be nice if we could maybe uh, apportion it the way the uh, House is made up. Um, and that's nothing against you, Mr. Chairman, at all. But uh, This room uh, is pretty evenly divided. Yeah, right. And. Uh, <clears throat> As far as the Frank Mail is concerned, uh, amen on that. Uh, I think that you're trying to move in the right direction, and uh, I'll work hardly support that effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Dick Zimmer. He's not here? Okay. Well, it seems that we've taken the testimony for every member that has been in attendance. The chair will now declare itself in a recess. What time do we meet, Mr. Chairman? Probably about 1.30 on foreign operations. So the chair is in recess, subject to call of the chair. For more information, write to the House Rules Committee at H312 in the Capitol, Washington, D.C., 20515. Coming next, a discussion of congressional spending and the balanced budget amendment proposal.
For a behind-the-scenes look at the United States Capitol, C-SPAN offers Exploring the Capitol, a self-guided tour through the halls of Congress. With more than 70 pages, Exploring the Capitol examines...